So Nigel Farage, ex-UKIP leader and now head of the Brexit party, has been stoking racial hatred in this country for decades, from blaming HIV rates on immigration to standing in front of that infamous poster of refugees with the header breaking Point Farage is a man more responsible than anyone for the amplification and mainstreaming of far-right narratives in this country. Yet for the last three years, LBC have provided Farage with a primetime platform five days a week. You know, that's a, hu you know, it's a huge platform, a huge reason he has so much influence in this country still. However, that was only until this Thursday. Um, so let's look at the outburst which sparked Farage's downfall. Um, so this is a tweet from Nigel Farage. A new form of the Taliban was born in the UK today. Unless we get moral leadership quickly, our cities won't be worth living in. Um, in case you missed the context, the Taliban, or who he's referring to as the Taliban, is the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, on Tuesday, he was asked about this on Good Morning Britain. This was his defence. Just to clarify, why did you compare Black Lives Matter protesters to the Taliban? Do you know, the BBC have consistently over the last week refused to tell people the truth about Black Lives Matter. The slogan, Black Lives Matter, and the wanting to end injustice and inequality is an laudable aim. The organisation, Black Lives Matter, is a far-left Marxist organisation whose chief aim is to defund and close down police forces so that we would live Nigel, under... Oh, you're this full of such utter nonsense, this Nigel Farage. Nonsense. I understand that you're you struggling to be relevant. But every, let me tell you something, the only thing you're an expert on, Nigel Farage, the only thing you're an expert on right now is your backside because every word out of your mouth sticks. <laughs> That's quite entertaining. Um, in any case, two days after that, um, LBC tweeted this. So Nigel Farage's contract with LBC is up very shortly and following discussions with him, Nigel is stepping down from LBC with immediate effect. We thank Nigel for the enormous contribution he has made to LBC and wish him well. Um, so this was all quite abrupt. The language used is quite careful. They haven't said they've fired him, but his contract wasn't over. So he, he left before his contract was up. He was in fact due to have a live show that day. Um, so they had to pull him from the air that evening. Someone else, I think it was Ian Dale, took his place. Um, so, Aaron, I mean, this is a genuine cause for celebration, even if it is well, incredibly belated. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing's just puzzling. I mean, who who thinks they can get away with saying that? It's kind of incredible calling calling a bunch of people looking for equality under the law, you know, comparing them to the Taliban and the whole thing of, oh, our cities won't be worth living in soon. He lives in, first of all, he lives in like rural Kent, right? Nigel Farage hasn't hasn't believed that British cities are worth living in probably since like 1962. Uh, he's complained before about people, uh, you know, if you were driving out or getting the tube. Um, from central London going through zones one, two, three, four, then going out through some of the suburbs, you would struggle to hear English. He's, he's gone on record saying that. He doesn't like modern city life. Uh, so the idea that that would change because of uh, Winston Churchill's statue being boarded up for the fifth time in 10 years or whatever, just kind of seem, it seems absurd. What, what Farage does, you know, the more history you read on this stuff, uh, the more you realise he's just relitigating the exact same things that were made in the 1980s. You know, in the 1980s, a gay Labour parliamentary candidate was was uh, a room went round that he had attended the Gay Olympics. Nobody actually knew what this was, but it was a it was a sun front <laughs> it was a sun front page. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, Peter Tatchell. That was what they Is got that him Peter with. Tatchell, it was, right? Yeah, yeah. It, was the, it was the by election in um, in uh, Bermondsey and Southwark, and yeah, he'd gone to the Gay Olympics, and then sort of you know, Michael Foot was being asked, "Do you have a gay candidate?" Of course, the Labour left was saying, yeah, we've got, you know, we, we defend, we stand by LGBT people. Not even Neil Kinnock could be like, yeah, sick, you know, or not, or, or Michael Foote. None mm -hmm. of the kind of, the, at that time, the soft Tribune I left. Um, uh, and people like Farage are just saying the same things that, that they said then, you know, cities are unlivable. Cities are now, are now subject to cultural Marxism and, and minorities and the radical left. That was the exact same ar argument that was made against the, the GLC under Ken Livingston in the, in the early to mid 1980s. These people are stuck in a time warp. Uh, what I think Farage has seen is probably a political opportunity to, to ensure he's relevant after Brexit with Black Lives Matter mm. and kind of increasingly English, it's important to say English, identitarian issues like Churchill.
Look, I want to look at some of the background to this. There was an interesting article in the HuffPo. Um, they'd spoken to some of the staff at the LBC, uh, LBC, sorry, because obviously disquiet has been going on there for a very long time. What he said this week wasn't really, you know, qualitatively worse than what he's been saying for the past two decades. But let's get up a couple of quotes from this article speaking to staff there. So they write, a black staffer at Global who asked to remain anonymous had previously told HuffPost UK that many global staff members want Farage out. The staffer said, the man is vile and racist. I'm upset he's working on a station across the corridor from the UK's biggest black music station and he's allowed to say those comments on air. So later in that article, Nadine White, she's the author of the article, quotes a source saying, pretty much every black person here is upset that Farage continues to have a platform, yet Global says it's committed to equality. This says a lot. Now, the context here, um, these aren't necessarily people who work for LBC because Global is a very big organization. You might not have heard of it, but it's in the background running many radio stations you probably have heard of. They include Capital and Capital Extra. Capital Extra is a particularly interesting example here because unlike LBC, they have lots of ethnic minority hosts and they play predominantly black music. And there was some other background in this article that I thought was you know, very interesting about the culture and the function of Global. So this this conglomerate, this this company that runs um, radio stations. So let's get this section of the article up. So it says, established in 1990 and acquired by Global in 2005, Choice FM was the UK's first legal black radio platform. It was rebranded without warning to Capital Extra, billed as an urban dance platform in 2013 during Black History Month. All specialist shows such as gospel and soccer were scrapped never to be reinstated. Sorry, the introduction I should have given you um, is that LBC, sorry, Global bought um, Choice FM. So Choice FM, very successful black music station. Global bought it and then they shifted it without telling anyone <laughs> or without getting any consent to Capital Extra. Let's go to the next graphic. The revered station's legacy has faded with many deeming this move from Global as a direct affront to the black community and an attempt at erasing an important part of black culture from the mainstream. So this is a company that bought Britain's first legal black radio station and who, against the wishes of the black staff, you know, changed its sort of role, its name, its function, and then kept employing Nigel Farage down the corridor. Um, so you can see sort of the, the toxic role they've played in terms of Britain's cultural industries. And let's go at the people who were making these decisions. Let's take a look at the people who, brought, who bought sorry, Britain's first legal black radio station. Um, so this is the executives of Global. So you've got 10 people, all of them white, nine of them men. Um, one thing I find quite entertaining is the only woman there, her job is chief people officer. What is it? What, 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 what job is chief people officer? It's like, oh, women, they're people, people. Um, the, you know, the, the idea that these are the people who are making all of these decisions, I suppose, explains quite a lot as to what LBC's output is like. You know, they also have you know Nick Ferrari on in the morning, who, as we saw on Wednesday, has you know said some pretty racist things on air. Aaron, what do you make of all of this? I listen to LBC because I quite like talk radio, but it is, I mean, the fact that they feel they can get away with having you know nearly all of their hosts are white guys. You know, the furthest left they go is sort of James O'Brien, a sort of Remainer liberal, and everyone else is you know whenever they're pushing the boat out, it is definitely to the right they're, they're shifting the overton window in that direction yeah they're all i mean they're all anti-left i mean james o'brien you'd probably say he's a, he's a liberal you know um they're anti uh, majid nawaz calls himself a liberal i don't think he is a liberal in any meaningful sense of the word because he can't you know tolerate disagreement and debate um they're anti-left you know Majid nawaz is vehemently anti-left james o'brien hates the left you know he was calling all labor party he tweeted labor party members are all holocaust deniers i was like this is an insane thing to say he said, a party full of Holocaust tonight. It's just repulsive, really revolting thing to say. So you're right. I and mean, what's interesting is you brought up a picture of the kind of executive team. Presumably the head of people is HR or something. But if you got up uh, the, the sort of the LBC radio roster, uh, they all look related, you know? Um, Nick Ferrari, Ian Dale, Clive Ball, James O'Brien. There was a couple of people. Tom Swarbrick used to work for Theresa May. They, they kind of, if you would like, yeah, it's a kind of family. Mm. They're kind of brothers and uncles and nephews I, I can totally believe that it's not even that they're all white you know they all have the kind of same skin complexion they all look the kind of same it's odd 
it's odd. And look, at the end of the day, we have to say Britain's it's a it's a white country primarily, but London is a really mixed city. In no in no way reflects London politically, ethnically culturally like not at all you you couldn't have a, a poorer reflection of what london looks like and sounds like and thinks uh and you know something should be done about that farage when the question is now who's going to replace him uh mm. and it, it can't just be oh yeah let's get a black or brown person with the exact same ideas let's get you know uh uh well there's very few of those around in, in their defense but you know a, a black conservative a brown conservative come on let's have a bit of dissensus but the problem is they won't ever do that you know owen jones mm. has had his own show on there a few times pilots they would never make it a radio show because of course he'll be right about so many things he'll prove so many of their regulars to look so stupid so quickly uh, all of a sudden i think that'll become a problem for the brand you know their brand is uh, kind of very angry uh, 50 something white males and actually, I don't think necessarily that's that's the audience. I think if there was a purely business decision going on, uh, they'd get a, a, a young, BAME woman. We'll see. Well, with someone, I think with left-wingers, they're worried that they'll critique the basis of the company because, I mean, it is a bit of a... It's an asset stripping company buys smaller radio stations, lays off staff, shuts them down. It's kind of it seems like it has a bit of a parasitical relationship to the UK's cultural industries. Um, and it's tax it's tax arrangements aren't entirely it, exactly. So 100%. they don't want to get they don't they don't want to get a, a host who is calling out that kind of thing. I just wanted to point out that in terms of insular groups of people from the establishment running Britain's news organizations, there was some breaking news today, which was George Osborne. They've, well, he, he became editor at the Evening Standard, of course. Um, he's stood down. Today we found out his replacement. And it's former British Vogue deputy editor Emily Sheffield, who, wait for it, you might not have heard of her, I hadn't either, but she just so happens to be ex-Prime Minister David Cameron's sister-in-law, right? So, I mean, it was a joke when George Osborne got that job. He went straight from being the Tory chancellor to being the editor of London's most widely read newspaper without any journalism background. Now he's been replaced and he's been replaced by David Cameron's sister-in-law. You know, the, these people will have sat at not even professional dinner parties together. Like, you know, just like someone's birthday. You know, these people all know each other, all come from exactly the same background. And now they're running... London's, you know, most probably most politically significant newspaper. The Metro might be more widely read, but the Evening Standard definitely has more political influence. I mean, you couldn't make it up, could you? You think? I mean, it's kind of it's finished, right? Do you not the think it's finished, Standard. Michael? Well, I mean, well, we don't know. We don't know what's going to bounce back after no, that. She she said that you know she's basically she's there to lead on making it a digital first company. Making it the a whole, digital thing, yeah. Yeah, the whole point of even the Evening Standard is it's fr that's their thing. It's a free shoot which gets loads of eyeballs and it sells advertising. Yeah, you know, two thirds of the Evening Standard is based basically advertising. That's not going to work with an online model. I mean, they're they're finished. The whole the whole the whole revenue model of the free sheet doesn't seem to work anymore. So I don't know. I mean, you're saying it's influential. I, I think it's probably. In a way, it's probably a symbol of the company's sort of imminent collapse. Mm. And actually, if you look at the, the Lebedev's other assets, the I has really struggled. Um, obviously, the Independent's already, it's no longer a newspaper, despite the absolute um, shambles of it regularly showing a front page on the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers. It's like showing Navarra Media's front page. We don't have a front page. Uh, it's just the, living in complete denial of the fact they're no longer a newspaper. Uh, I think the Evening Standard will probably follow suit. You know, will it will it be an influential thing? No, like people on on LBC and talk radio and BBC will talk about it, but I think average Londoner, mm. I, I think the Evening Standard's influence has been going down for a very long time. I remember in two thousand and four eight during the London mayoral elections, when they went for Ken Livingston, especially in two thousand and eight, it was a really big player. And sort of like, Boris Johnson could not have won without the Evening Standard. Mm. I just don't think that's the case now. I just think it's kind of like well, just pathetic. Uh, so yeah, because well, they really went for Sadiq Khan, actually, didn't they? That was a really mm. toxic, hostile campaign against him, often, you know, seemingly a bit racially motivated. Yeah. And then I remember, you know, the day then he has, gets a stomping victory the next day, like, oh, Sadiq Khan, maybe he's okay, great. Um, so they sort yeah. of had to go back with their tail between their legs. Um, obviously, Sadiq Khan isn't the kind of guy who sort of like likes to have a, a populist showdown with national newspapers. So I think he was fine for them to come back with their tail between their legs, make peace. The, the thing is, you know, Mike, Michael Foote actually was was the editor of the Evening Standard, I think, just immediately following the Second World War. You know, it wasn't always a really oh, right-wing right. newspaper. Yeah, it wasn't always a really right-wing newspaper. So, you know, in a way, there's a bit of a legacy there that's that, that's going to be lost. But um, 
influential? I don't know. I mean, I think the future of political influences is LBC, talk radio. I don't think it's print media. And I think these people realize that, right? I think mm. there's a reason why Rupert Murdoch's gone into Times Radio. There's a reason why they bought talk radio. You know, it, 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 okay, there's a bit of business going on. It might make some money, but primarily it's about creating a, a vehicle to advance certain political interests. And I think now people look at the sort of the hybrid of the radio slash social media kind of platform as doing that far more effectively than the newspaper. Mm -hmm.